Hey everyone, Dr. Carmen Bryant here with NursingSchool911.net. NCLEX season is up on us, so I decided to make a video for you guys tonight talking about electrolytes. Um, this is probably a topic that you had at the beginning of your program or you're going to have if you're starting the program in the fall, um, but it is extremely important to nail these electrolytes down. Um, the underlying etiologies of electrolyte imbalances and the most frequently seen and the most dangerous signs and symptoms of electrolyte imbalances. Um, so let's get right into it and start off with talking about sodium. So normal range for sodium is going to be anywhere between 135 to 145 um, milli equivalents per liter. Every program is going to vary probably, you know, a little bit in what they tell you is normal. So always go with what your program teaches you. Um, but 135, 145 is easy to remember. That's what we're gonna go with here. Anything below 135 is considered hyponatremia. Anything higher than 145 is considered hyper. All right, hypo is low, hyper is high. So our main causes for hyponatremia include hemodilution. So hemodilution is a state of fluid volume overload. Most frequently, um, what causes fluid volume overload is a, a pump that is not pumping correctly. In other words, congestive heart failure. All right, so congestive heart failure leads to a state of excess fluid um, because the heart is not pumping fluid through the body like it should. This leads to what we call a dilutional hyponatremia. Also renal failure. So when kidneys cannot excrete urine um, as they're you know, supposed to, then that leads to a state of fluid volume excess and again, dilutional hyponatremia. Also something called SIADH or syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. Antidiuretic hormone is a hormone that is secreted by your posterior pituitary. When it is secreted in excess in the endocrine disorder SIADH, um, it causes your kidneys to retain fluid, antidiuretic. Um, so this leads to fluid volume excess, dilutional hyponatremia. The main things when we think about sodium, I always teach sodium um, the abbreviation starts with an N, the letter N. So when you think about sodium, you're going to think about nerves, all right? So anytime that there's a sodium imbalance, think about the nervous system and gravitate towards signs and symptoms um, that have to do with the central nervous system. So those are the underlying causes, the main underlying causes for um, hyponatremia. And you can have insensible losses through sweating, um, and things like that, but mainly it's going to be hemodilution and those um, disease states that I discussed. Um, on the flip side, when you have hypernatremia or elevated sodium, it's mainly caused by a state of hemoconcentration or fluid volume deficit. Okay, so think of somebody that um, has had prolonged vomiting, prolonged diarrhea, um, you know, excess fluid losses. Um, they will have a state of hemoconcentration leading to an, a falsely elevated sodium level. Um, the opposite endocrine disorder of SIADH is something called diabetes insipidus. This is where ADH is not secreted um, in sufficient amounts. And this happens to people with neurological issues. Um, so people that have had uh, brain trauma, traumatic brain injuries, um, brain surgery's gone wrong, okay? Remember, ADH is secreted by the posterior pituitary, and so any damage at all to the posterior pituitary can lead to um, deficient amounts of ADH being secreted, and so the patient urinates and urinates and urinates up to 20 liters per day. Um, so that would lead to a state of hemoconcentration and making the sodium level then appear very elevated because of that state of hemoconcentration. So let's go back to our signs and symptoms, our manifestations. What are we most frequently going to look for? What are the most dangerous manifestations? Well, for hyponatremia, um, you're going to have things kind of in the early stage, you know, a little bit of weakness, a little bit of fatigue, um, you know, lethargy, maybe some nausea, vomiting, 
Um, getting on into things like signs and symptoms of elevated intracranial pressure. Okay, so um, because of low sodium, what happens to our cells is when sodium is low, our cells swell, all right? And so when our cells swell, then that causes um, sometimes the most dangerous um, effect of that is cerebral swelling or cerebral edema, okay? And so manifestations of cerebral edema would be the headache, um, the lethargy, the projectile vomiting, um, leading to seizures and a state of coma, okay, altered mental status. Um, so all those things, you know, have to do with the central nervous system. You can also have your patient complaining of or reporting muscle cramping. Um, but we have, um, you know, for a long time, I've, I've always worked critical care. And for a long time, I've, you know, known that patients come in um, and where they have drank water um, and prevented themselves from urinating because they know that if they drink and they drink and they drink and they drink for whatever reason, they're gonna have seizures, okay? And so what they've done there um, is they've induced a state of hyponatremia. Um, so polydipsia, um, you know, excessive drinking. Um, I've, I've taken care of prisoners before that have done that um, just to get out of jail and come to the hospital. Okay, and so you're only gonna see those really severe signs and symptoms like seizures when sodium levels reach really low levels like below 110, okay? So keep that in mind. Um, so the things that you'll look for with hypernatremia really is going to be thirst, okay? Um, just think about when you've had something really salty to eat like a french fry or something like that, you're gonna feel really thirsty, okay? You can also have, again, those manifestations, the headache, um, you know, the muscle cramps, um, you know, mu muscle cramps, weakness. So, you know, things along the line of central nervous system stuff, all right? So with hypernatremia though, we're not gonna be worrying about the seizures and um, increased ICP um, because our cells are actually gonna shrink when sodium is elevated, okay? So hyponatremia, the cells swell, we have cerebral swelling, cerebral edema, and manifestations that accompany that. All right, so moving on down to potassium. This is my personal favorite. Um, very narrow range here. We say that potassium can range between 3.5 and 5 milliequivalents. Again, always go by what your program teaches you. Um, so low potassium or hypokalemia, below that level of 3.5. Um, diuretics, okay? So, furosemide, it's a loop diuretic um, that we give very, very frequently in the setting of congestive heart failure. It is going to pull potassium off like crazy, all right? So, anytime that, that I go with my students or anything to give furosemide, we are going to look at that potassium level and make sure that it is within normal limits. Um, insulin, so insulin forces potassium back into the cells. Um, sodium lives outside the cell. Um, it's in the ECF or the extracellular fluid, whereas potassium is inside the cell. It lives in the intracellular fluid, okay? So whenever one of these is high, the other is gonna be low. They have kind of an inverse relationship because of where they live in relation to the cell, okay? sodium outside the cell, potassium inside the cell. Matter of fact, 65 to 75% of potassium lives inside muscle cells, okay? And mainly cardiac muscle cells, okay? So we'll get to that when we start talking about signs and symptoms. So on the flip side, with hyperkalemia, we're gonna think about things like renal failure. When the kidneys are no longer able to um, filter and secrete and excrete like they're supposed to, uh, potassium is going to build up. So patients with that end-stage renal disease, um, acute kidney injury, we're going to look for hyperkalemia. Also, anytime there's a state of acidosis, um, we're going to look for hyperkalemia. I always teach my students, acidosis, hyperkalemia, they go hand in hand. Um, 
But then the, something funny, you know, will happen. Those patients, let's say we have a COPD patient. They come in, they're exacerbating their COPD um, because they've got a respiratory infection or something like that. We start giving them breathing treatments, or those beta agonists like um, albuterol, those short acting beta agonists like albuterol. Those bring potassium down. So if somebody is getting repeated short acting beta agonists like uh, albuterol, you gotta watch that potassium. Like anything that we do in the hospital, you know, to correct this imbalance, um, you know, can, can lead to another one, all right? Um, also, potassium sparing diuretics like spironolactone um, can lead to hyperkalemia. Um, but so those are just some things, you know, the, the most common things that come to mind um, when we think about hypo versus hyperkalemia. Now, the manifestations, remember, Potassium lives in the muscle cells. So we're going to have uh, muscle weakness. We're going to have paresthesia or you know numbness and tingling um, within the extremities. We are going to have dysrhythmias because potassium lives within cardiac muscle cells. All right, so with hypokalemia, you're gonna see things like um, you know, PVCs, frequent PVCs are those premature ventricular uh, contractions. So we're looking at ventricular dysrhythmias, okay? So those dangerous dysrhythmias. Um, with hyperkalemia, the heart rate's gonna slow down. We'll see um, things like bradycardia. We might see things like a very tall peaked T wave, um, a very wide QRS, all right? So either way, um, we're going to see cardiac manifestations. So anybody with potassium imbalances or anybody that's at risk for potassium imbalances, you know, uh, the tests like to ask questions about that. Put them on a cardiac monitor. Make sure they're on telemetry, okay? Uh, get an EKG. You know, that's always a very important nursing action when there is a potassium imbalance Going back to sodium, um, I was just when talking about furosemide as a loop diuretic. Thiazide diuretics are notorious for pulling sodium off. So remember that one as well. Thiazide diuretics and hyponatremia. All right. So recapping real quick with sodium, we're thinking about central nervous system thing. Things like um, headaches, uh, things like muscle, you know, weakness, muscle cramps. All right. Reports of muscle cramps lethargy, you know, mental status issues, and then on into the more severe manifestations of increased ICP because of cerebral edema. So seizures, um, you know, leading all the way to coma, okay? With potassium, obviously it is cardiac all the way. Um, so cardiac dysrhythmias, um, frequent PVCs um, with high potassium, you know, those tall peaked T waves, um, wide QRS complexes, you might see a U wave. So make sure that you get them on the cardiac monitor. Um, and always before you give furosemide, if the exam question asks you about that, you're gonna look at that potassium level and make sure that it's within normal limits before you know that it's safe to give um, that furosemide. Um, some other disorders like, um, endocrine disorders that mess with potassium. So Addison's disease, what is Addison's disease? Addison's disease is an endocrine disorder of the adrenal cortex. This is where we need to add some hormones. Um, so we're gonna be deficient in aldosterone and cortisol. Well, cortisol translates to sugar. Aldosterone is our salt water hormone, okay? So Addison's disease is going to affect sodium and potassium. So if we're deficient in aldosterone as we are in Addison disease, then we're going to be deficient in sodium because aldosterone is our salt water hormone. So if we're deficient in sodium, we're going to be high in potassium, okay? So with Addison disease, you're gonna have low sodium, elevated potassium, remember that. Um, we, we wanna make sure that we're checking our potassium level in someone with Addison disease. 
So the opposite of that is gonna be something called Cushing disease or Cushing syndrome. Um, Cushing syndrome mainly focuses on cortisol. There's an excess of cortisol, so blood glucose is gonna be elevated. Um, so you wanna make sure you're watching that. <clears throat> so when blood glucose is elevated, we're gonna be given a lot of insulin, you know, so that could affect your potassium as well. Um, all right, so moving on down to calcium. So our ranges for calcium is eight and a half to 10 and a half. Again, always go by what your program is telling you. So calcium, um, the main thing that I think of when I think of disorders or disease processes that drop our calcium level is renal failure um, for a couple reasons. Renal failure, so the kidneys, one of the kidneys main job um, is synthesis of vitamin D. All right, if the kidneys are failing, they're not synthesizing vitamin D, therefore we're not absorbing calcium. Also, when the kidneys fail, they do not secrete and excrete phosphorus. Calcium and phosphorus have an inverse relationship. So in renal failure, phosphorus is going to be very elevated, calcium is going to be very low. All right, so also parathyroid hormone. Parathyroid hormone is secreted by the parathyroids. Um, so if we have an issue where there is hypoparathyroidism, in other words, the, the parathyroids are not able to secrete adequate PTH, then we're going to be dealing with hypocalcemia or low calcium. So I think of um, people that have, you know, had maybe their thyroid removed, um, you know, and as a side effect, the parathyroids are damaged or whatever. Always be thinking along those lines of low calcium, of hypocalcemia. Um, because the parathyroids are just four little beads located on the back of your thyroid gland right here. Um, on the flip side, hypercalcemia, I think of increased PTH or hyperparathyroidism. Um, so that can be, you know, caused by many different things. It can be just primary hyperparathyroidism um, where, you know, the parathyroids are just over secreting um, parathyroid hormone. Also immobility. Um, so immobility that leads to bone, the breakdown of bone, um, that's going to cause calcium to then leak out of the bones and into the bloodstream. Okay. So immobility leading to breakdown of bone can cause hypercalcemia. Um, because 99% of your calcium is located in your bones and your teeth. All right. Also, something called uh, perineoplastic syndrome. This is um, something that can take on many different forms, but basically you can have um, tumors that secrete ectopic uh, parathyroid hormone. Um, so any kind of cancerous state, you know, if it's asking about cancer and calcium, always go with uh, increased calcium, okay, in a state of malignancy because of something called perineoplastic syndrome, where PTH is being secreted when it's not supposed to be um, secreted. So signs and symptoms. I always tell my students to remember, calcium calms, all right? So if we have an excess of calcium, I like to go with that first because calcium calms. Everything is going to be low and slow, all right? So you're thinking about um, the, the role that it plays in cardiac function you would see bradycardia, um, you would see constipation, you would see kidney stones. Um, so everything's going to be low and slow. The patient would be calm, you know, their mental status would be, you know, kind of decreased, you know, as calcium got really, really high. With hypocalcemia, um, if calcium calms and we're lacking calcium, everything's going to be kind of hyper, all right? So two things that I wanna mention, um, these fall under that umbrella term of something called tetany. So you would have a positive trousseau sign, positive chivostic sign. So trousseau sign can be elicited by placing a blood pressure cuff on someone, um, blowing it up, and you would then see the patient's wrist kind of spasm. That's a positive trousseau sign. That's a sign of very low calcium. Um, chivostic sign, positive chivostic sign can be elicited by tapping on the patient's facial nerve. 
you would then see an ipsilateral contraction of this side of the patient's face. Again, that's a sign of very low calcium. All right, so tetany. Let's talk about the most dangerous sign of hypocalcemia, and that's laryngospasm, okay? So a patient that, let's say they've had their thyroid removed, um, you know, and we're worried about low calcium. That patient starts complaining of dyspnea. Then we're worried about um, hypocalcemia to the point of laryngospasm. All right, so laryngospasm is going to be the most dangerous um, complication of low calcium. So always remember, ABC, airway, breathing, circulation. All right, um, calcium also plays a very important role in blood clotting. So you need adequate calcium to actually form thrombin, to form an adequate blood clot. So if calcium is very low, the patient is at risk for bleeding. Um, but again, airway, laryngeal spasm is the most dangerous complication of low calcium, of hypocalcemia. All right, so moving on to magnesium. Uh, magnesium ranges from 1.5 to 2.1. And when I think about low magnesium, I think about um, alcohol overuse, all right, or ETOH. Um, on the flip side, excess magnesium or hypermagnesemia is usually caused by renal failure, all right? So when the kidneys can't secrete and excrete magnesium, magnesium goes up. So calcium calms, magnesium mellows, all right? So if magnesium is elevated, everything's gonna be kind of low and slow. Um, so when you think about magnesium, it plays a role in muscle contraction, um, plays a big role in deep tendon reflexes or DTRs, all right? So if you have a question where it's asking about depressed or decreased DTRs, then you're gonna think about elevated magnesium levels. Also, magnesium is a very potent vasodilator. Um, so elevated magnesium levels, drop blood pressure, okay? And also that vasodilatory effect leads to uh, flushing, um, you know, the skin feeling warm or whatever, um, and can also lead to a headache because of vasodilation. Um, so on the flip side, if magnesium mellows and, you know, the patient is low in magnesium, then your DTRs would be hyper, okay? Um, blood pressure, you know, might be elevated but mainly tests love to ask about deep tendon reflexes, okay? So hyperreflexia would be a manifestation of hypomagnesemia. All right, so phosphorus. Phosphorus ranges from 2.5 to 4.5. When we think about phosphorus being low, I think about um, malabsorption syndromes, like maybe someone that's had a gastric bypass um, and they're just not able to absorb, you know, vitamins and minerals like they should. Um, diarrhea, antacids, um, antacids mainly that contain a lot of calcium because remember, if calcium is elevated, then um, phosphorus is gonna be low because calcium and phosphorus have an inverse relationship. Renal failure is gonna be our number one culprit for high phosphorus levels, okay? So as far as signs and symptoms, all you've got to remember is the manifestations of hypocalcemia and hypercalcemia, okay? The exact same manifestations that you're gonna see with hypocalcemia, that's what you're gonna see with hyperphosphatemia. The manifestations that you see with hypercalcemia is exactly what you're gonna see with hypophosphatemia, all right? Um, so I, I think along the lines of diet, nutrition type questions, um, when I think about phosphorus, you know, our patients that are on renal diets, we can't give them, you know, Cokes, um, a big soda or anything like that because it's got a lot of phosphorus in it. Um, so make sure that you know, you know, all these foods, uh, all these electrolytes that we've talked about, um, make sure that you know foods that um, contain high amounts of each of these electrolytes in case you're asked a nutrition question, which NCLEX loves to do, by the way. Um, finally, chloride. We don't talk about chloride just a whole, whole lot. Um, it ranges from 95 to 105 milliosmoles per liter. So 
sodium and chloride kind of travel along together. Um, sodium having a positive charge, chloride having a negative charge, so they're attracted to each other in that way. Um, so basically, if sodium is low, chloride is going to be low as well. Um, if sodium is high, chloride is going to be high as well. Um, so prolonged vomiting, diarrhea, a state of alkalosis. Um, so these are things that can lead to a state of hypochloremia. And then on the flip side, like I said, you know, hypernatremia, you're also going to have elevated chloride levels and then a state of dehydration, which would lead to a state of hemoconcentration, thus elevating your sodium levels would lead to um, elevated chloride levels as well. All right, but remember um, chloride and the alkalosis connection there. All right, so if chloride is low, um, then that is usually indicative of a state of alkalosis, okay, because of the role that chloride plays with acid-base balance. All right, so that is just a pretty quick rundown of um, the electrolyte values that you need to know, their most common causes for imbalances of each electrolyte, the most common and then the most dangerous manifestations of electrolyte imbalances. Again, like I said, NCLEX tip, go back and make sure that you know which foods contain a lot of each one of these electrolytes. Um, because I guarantee you're going to be asked, especially about um, potassium um, when you're talking about renal diets and phosphorus when you're talking about renal diets, okay? Um, so that wraps up this video. I hope that you have found this helpful. If you're starting nursing school soon, best of luck to you. Make sure you check out all the other resources on nursingschool911.net. If you're about to take NCLEX, good luck. You got this. Um, next gen, make sure you practice a bunch of case studies, all right? And thanks so much for watching my video tonight.